You're a hard man to reach to. I'm glad I made it today. My name's Felix. I have a question for you about health care. All right. I disagree with you on this issue. Uh, we spend more on per capita than any other country in the world and have some of the worst results. According to the World Health Organization, we were 37th in 2000, 49th in 2009, and 50th in 2010. We also lead in mortality amenable to health care with over 45,000 um, people that will die every year because of it. The top 17 countries, and I have the list right here, that have the best health care in the world uses some form of universal health care, whether that be single payer, a two-tired system, or a government-mandated program. I am curious to know why you continue to deny that universal health care is, is, is an effective system. And before you answer the question, I personally would advocate for a two-tight system, not single payer. Okay. So the answer is that it depends on what you're going for. Really, it does. Uh, so th there's a couple reasons. Well, let me put it this way. Here's the framework that I use when I'm thinking about health care. Uh, and sorry, before that, just organizing my thoughts here. Before that, uh, the first thing to mention is that all of the countries that are doing really well on health care also were doing well on health care before the implementation of a nationalized health care system. It's not the national health care system that changed Sweden into a healthy country or Norway into a healthy country. These were healthy countries before that happened. That's just the way it is. The United States is mainly unhealthy because we eat a bunch of shit here, right? I mean, <laughs> that's, that, that really is the reason. Our diet is really different than it is in, for example, Japan or in Norway where people tend to exercise more and are healthier as an overall metric. Uh, so comparing populations is not like, it depends on where you are comparing. If you compare Norwegians in the United States to people who live in Norway, my guess is you probably wouldn't see an enormous difference in the level of health care obtained. Number two, the United States healthcare system is a disaster area. It's actually the worst of all possible worlds. It is not a free market system and it's not a totally regulated system. It's somewhere in between, which means it's heavily regulated and heavily subsidized, which leads to increased costs. That's why it's so expensive. When we say that we're spending an enormous amount per capita, we should define who the we is. The we is not the government. The we is the government plus private expenditures on health care. Now, it's my decision whether I want to spend a lot of money on end-of-life care. It's my decision whether I want to spend a lot of money on immediate care. So it's not quite a one-to-one -one ratio the way that people are making it out to be. And that's why in the United States, for example, when it comes to five-year cancer survival rates, we actually rank number one in the world. That's because you actually have availability of health care if you can pay for it. The question is, how do you bring the cost down? So now to my model of how I think about health care. The Dan McLaughlin in National Review puts it this way. He says you can have three things in health care. You can have affordability, universality, and quality. Those are the three things that you're looking for in health care. Every system can guarantee no better than two. So most of the systems that you're talking about, if they are universal, they are not affordable in the sense that the government does rack up enormous surcharges on that basis. Now, that may not be as much as we're spending here, because as I say, we have the worst of all available systems. We're not free market and we're not nationalized. But Canada's healthcare system is extraordinarily expensive. Britain's healthcare is extraordinarily expensive. Norway's healthcare is extraordinarily expensive, which is why the tax rates on people in the middle class and lower classes is still exorbitantly high. Like the United States actually has a far more progressive system of taxation than Switzerland or Sweden or Norway. Right? All of those countries have income taxes of 60% for folks making about 60 grand a year. It's really, really high. There is a cost to it. Now, the question is, what are you looking for? So what I am looking for is affordability and quality and not universality. Universal health care is good if you're looking for universality. If you're looking for universality and affordability, you don't spend a lot of money in your ration health care. You see some single-payer systems that are like this. If you're looking for universality and quality, then you don't care that much about affordability. You just spend an awful lot of money on it. And if you're looking for quality and affordability, then you have a free market system because that's what free markets generate. They can generate near universality, but not complete universality. This is true for food products, for example. It's not true that everyone has equal access to food, but food is extraordinarily cheap in the United States and very high quality, at least what you can get. So the question is, how do you wish to define the balance between rights and duties in a civilized society? My answer is I want, you know, I want affordability and quality, and I want social fabric picking up the rest, particularly at local level, and hopefully before you get to the governmental level. The problem I have with the universal health care system is that it tends to drive down supply of doctors and nurses unless you spend exorbitant amounts of cash, right? You have to import people from other countries to do that work. This is what's happened in Britain, where they're importing a lot of their healthcare system from India, for example. Or you have to spend enormous sums of, of money. So is there, are, there, are there nationalized healthcare systems that are better than ours? Yeah, there are. Australia is better than ours. Switzerland is better than ours. And I agree with you. If you were going to do this, you'd want a two-tiered system, right? Which is more like Switzerland. <coughs> but in my view, the best of all available systems would be a wild deregulation of the healthcare system itself, leading to lowered costs, higher quality, and then what's left over can be filled in with, with relatively minimal investment. I, just one thing. Can I email you with some responses? Sure. All absolutely. Right.
Thanks. <clears throat> Love you too. Good afternoon, Ben. Hey, uh, my question is on uh, Marbury v. Madison and yeah. judicial review. Uh, would this be your primary argument um, against Roe v. Wade that it was passed uh, and it isn't in the Constitution? And do you think, uh, as a follow-up to this, do you think it would be a better stance for social conservatives to take a libertarian approach to say that you're against abortion for the moral reasons, but that you would support it if it was passed through the states? No. The so so the, here is the – so when it comes to Marbury versus Madison and the place of judicial review, I don't like judicial review as a basic element of the system. I think it's quite controversial whether Marbury versus Madison was correctly decided in the first place because I don't think that the founders meant to create a super legislature of people who are the wisest and best among us to decide what the Constitution means. Uh, you know, the, it's still kind of hotly contested in conservative legal circles whether judicial review is a thing. Um, when it comes to abortion, the chief argument I have against Roe v. Wade on a constitutional level is that nowhere in the Constitution does it say there's a right to abortion because there is no right to abortion in the, in the actual Constitution of the United States. In fact, there's not anything even remotely approaching a right to abortion in the Constitution of the United States. However, when it comes to my moral, my moral stance on this, I'm not libertarian on abortion in the same way that I would not be libertarian on slavery. So in 1856, there was a very widespread debate in the United States between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas basically took the decentralized position on slavery. He said states should be able to decide for themselves whether or not they wish to preserve slavery or not. Why is it my business? It's not my state. It's not my life. The same argument could easily be made about abortion. Why is it my business? It's not my body. It's not my life. It's not my child. So, you know, if, if the state decides to be liberal about abortion, well, that's their business. If you believe that human life is being violated on a fundamental level by abortion itself, you cannot stand idly by and then kick it to states for a libertarian cause. I'm fine with libertarianism on causes that do not involve a violation of the most basic right, the right to live, that is not something where I'm willing to devolve that to the lowest level, the same way I'm not willing to suggest that any state that does not prosecute murder would, would be allowed to do that under the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States does not allow a state to simply say that murder is, is no longer a thing or slavery is, is fine. I'm not going to, to pretend that this is an issue on which libertarianism has anything to say. In fact, you can be a pro-life libertarian simply by saying that there is a fundamental right to life that ought to be protected for those who are unborn. I like the shirt. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you'd dig it. The first time I see a Sarah Press is overrated shirt will be a very great day. <laughs> um, so a lot of people, especially here, feel like you're just a fantastic debater, destroyer of liberals and their arguments. And that's not something I've actually seen a lot in practice. I've seen you out debate college students. Ooh. <laughs> so I've seen you out debate college students, but you know, they're college students. If you were debating 19-year-old you, I have no question that 19-year-old you would get absolutely destroyed. And I see you have kind of fireside chit chats with, you know, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson. Oh. It's so fine, it's really fine. Go ahead. And you're not really debating them in a substantial way either. They have differences of opinions, but I think you more focus on where you agree than where you disagree. So my question is, A, if this is correct, and there are some exceptions like uh, the Politicon debate last year, why do you think this is? Are liberals afraid to debate you? Are you afraid to debate them? Are there a lot of examples of really great head-to-head -head debates that I'm just missing? Sure, yeah, I mean, if you go back there, I did a series of debates in, uh, in Seattle with a group of folks, the local head of the NAACP, um, the writer for the Seattle Stranger on race. We did a debate with uh, uh, some gun, gun experts on gun rights. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've literally spent my entire life, have, my political life, having conversations with folks on the left. In fact, those are the conversations that I enjoy the most. As far as why there are all these tapes of me destroying liberals at college campuses, it's because college students apparently have more courage than a lot of professional political pundits who don't actually want to get on a stage. I've invited an inordinate number of folks on the left onto the Sunday special, specifically because I actually prefer, as opposed to the debate format, the discussion format, because it allows you to get a little bit deeper. Right? Debate formats themselves are built for how do you destroy the other side, how do you, how do you undermine a point, right? and that's fun. I don't think it's necessarily the most productive conversation. And as you see, like when somebody gets up and they ask about nationalized health care, I'm happy to have a conversation back and forth in a substantive way about health care, looking at the different priorities and how they reflect. 
And in fact, if you actually go back and you watch all the speeches that I've made on college campuses, I would say that there are many more exchanges of me talking with somebody on the left in respectful manner than there are tapes of me, quote unquote, destroying anybody. You know, those are the ones that people like to watch because they're more fun, but that doesn't mean that's what's actually happening on a daily basis. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Go ahead. For one quick follow-up, I do agree with you on the point that a lot of liberal pundits are, for whatever reason, afraid to debate you. So my follow-up question was going to be, under what circumstances would you, although I'm not a famous liberal pundit, ever be open to having a substantial, long-form, civil conversation with me? I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to have one if we can both carve out the time and I'm not losing money in doing it. Right? I mean, the, I mean this, is, this is the reality, is that I only have so much time in my life, and I've spent a lot of it talking with people. I mean, this is what my law school and college experience was about talking with folks on the left. I have friends on the left who I speak with on a regular basis. You know, I, I don't want to name names for fear of ruining their careers, but, the, but those conversations largely do happen behind closed doors. Um, but people have a fear of getting out in front of a camera, specifically because we do live in an environment where the rock'em, stock'em, robot stuff tends to get more attention than the substantive discussion stuff. Hi, I'm Nuance Bro. Um, I have a question <laughs> about your position on the Iraq War because uh, you have in the past, you know, made written articles about it, and I think even today you still say that you're in support of the Iraq War. Um, so my question is: Well, in the article that you wrote in 2005, you wrote that uh, it's important to spread democracy and that empire is a duty, um, not a choice. And you said it would be good to put democracy into Iraq, but when you did your uh, Islamic radical video and you but you picked all these different populations saying how radicalized they are. Is it necessarily a good idea to democratize these areas and have them vote kind of like they did in the Gaza Strip and then elected Hamas? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I think that I've become oh, just... a lot more realist on this issue. No, I totally, uh, like, I, I still think that the Iraq War didn't have to go how the Iraq War went. And I think that pulling out precipitously from Iraq was a huge foreign policy blunder on the part of the Obama administration. Uh, that if you actually wanted to form a more stable and lasting state there, you had to you really did have to stay there for a longer period of time. I also am in agreement with the general hawkish foreign policy view that you can't run from the world and then expect the world to stay at your border. Now, that's not the way that this works. With that said, I'm a lot less sanguine, I think, than I was in 2005 uh, about the possibilities of implanting democracy in places like Iraq when there was a lot of hope uh, about that. You know, I, I still think that there's a possibility, but it's not something that's going to take root overnight. I think there are a lot of us who are too optimistic about the possibility of that in 2005.